guest speaker for the night. Dr. Mike Murphy, he's an author of four books, a policy analyst and a columnist for 13 years with a post media chain which includes the National Post, the Calgary Herald, and more than, 20, and more than 25 other newspapers across the country. The Toronto Star describes Mark as a skilled researcher who uncovers information governments would prefer to keep hidden. Please welcome Dr. Murphy. And make sure I don't miss any thank yous. Um, so this is Billy the Kid. This is, uh, his real name is Henry McCarty. You know him as Billy the Kid. Billy was, as you know, a 19th century outlaw. And he was described as friendly and personable, five foot eight inches, a neat dresser with blue eyes, dirty blonde hair. So a bit like me back when I had more hair. <laughs> Unlike me, Billy the Kid was described as excellent with firearms, which is where he got into trouble. Uh, he killed a few people, apparently, somewhere between 8 and 21, according to legend, before he himself got killed in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, in 1881 uh, by a sheriff. Uh, Billy was 21 when he perished from this earth. There are many stories about Billy, uh, about his life and, and, and myth-making that goes along with it. The total truth will, of course, never be known because, of course, he's dead. <clears throat> but that leads me in a circuitous route to tonight's topic. Uh, while dead men tell no tales, goes the saying, uh, dead numbers can tell us a lot. So I'm going to tell you about Alberta and hopefully how she can become, how she was successful and how she can become successful again, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. So dead men tell no, de tell no tales, but dead numbers certainly do. Now, I understand you're a numbers-heavy crowd, so I'll get into some of those tonight more than I normally would. Uh, but let's, let's review the basics. Why do numbers matter? Well, numbers reveal stuff, and almost everyone in this room, if not all of you, would understand that. So if you're an engineer, you better make sure you get you know, your measurements right. If you want to construct a skyscraper, for example, if you want to build a ship, you better make sure it's not going to sink into the ocean, that sort of thing. So when you get it right, you can get some beautiful results. This is the Chrysler Building in New York City, in, in uh, Midtown Manhattan. I love Art Deco architecture. Uh, I've been in the Chrysler Building, if you ever get a chance to go inside there and look at this. It's a marvel, it's a masterpiece. It was built in the 1920s. So whoever put this together, the architects, the engineers, and so on and so forth, got the numbers right. 80 years later, it's still standing. Now, what happens when you get the numbers wrong? <laughs> the leaning Pisa in Italy. I I'm amazed, actually. There's, if you look closely, you can see like a lot of people down right below the, the structure there. And I was there for 10 minutes about 15 years ago, and I don't think I ever went that close to the, the tower just in case you have an earthquake or something or their supports don't actually hold any longer. Nonetheless, that's what happens when you get the numbers wrong. So in other words, getting the numbers right allows for a firm foundation uh, for long-term success. And this is, as this is as true for provincial economies as it is for buildings. So proper foundations matter. That's a basic point that you understand, but not a lot of people, not, not everyone does. And unfortunately, some of the people who don't understand this uh, sometimes run provincial economies uh, from legislatures and parliaments. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to go into some background or some detail here in what he call experiment number one in Alberta, the Klein experiment, and give some examples of how they got the firm foundation right and why that led to the prosperity that we knew until very recently. Because contrary to myth-making, it was not all about luck. Luck was only a small part of it, and even then, uh, not much, uh, contrary to, to expectations or contrary to uh, assumptions. What did Ralph Klein do, the former premier, the late premier, do when him and his colleagues decided to uh, try and create opportunity in Alberta, is how I'd put it? To create a firm foundation for future prosperity, what do they do? Some of you that have been around Alberta long enough, I first moved here in 1988, will know that in the later 1980s, the time was much like now. Oil prices were down. Uh, by the time Klein became premier in late 1992 and went to an election in 1993, the province had been running deficits for seven, eight years at that point. The province was going deeper and deeper into the red, into debt. They had to do something. So they started by pruning the budget. 
They got to a balanced budget about four years later. Then in the late 1990s, they began to cut personal taxes and soon after that, business taxes. That was part of the firm foundation that Premier Klein and his colleagues set for the province of Alberta. That was on the fiscal side. On the governance side, they did other things, such as uh, making sure that regulation was sensible. You can find lots of not so sensible regulation, but I think their bias at least was uh, honestly to not over-regulate Alberta, but have what was necessary and no more. They also were free enterprise friendly, very important for a firm foundation for prosperity. They were neutral for the most part among businesses and business sectors, and what I mean by this is again in the late 1980s, early 1990s, there was this move to try and diversify the Alberta economy. You hear this language again today, we need to diversify. Okay, in theory, that's a good idea. What the province of Alberta did, though, back in the 1980s, starting under Peter Lougheed and then Don Getty, the two premiers of that era, uh, they put a lot of money into loans and loan guarantees uh, for businesses across the, across the province, uh, most of them non-energy sector. And again, in theory, okay, you diversify the economy by helping other businesses. That's the theory. It never works so well. By 1993, the province had lost $2.4 billion on loans and loan guarantees, about $5 billion in today's dollars. I don't know about you, but to me, that's a lot of money. Those are roads that don't get built. Those are schools that don't get built. Those are highways that don't get paved, that sort of thing. So um, they also, so, so when Ralph Klein and his colleagues decided to rethink, okay, how are we going to make Alberta great? How are we going to make it prosper? They had to rethink even that, so they stopped those sorts of things, loan guarantees, what I call corporate welfare and what I write about regularly in the newspapers. Uh, I'm not a fan of subsidies to businesses because they don't work. Uh, they in fact are unfair to your competitor, they're unfair to taxpayers. So what the Klein government did, because this became a huge political issue by 1993, was several years later they actually introduced legislation in 1996 to say we're pretty much done with being in the business of being in business. It was a famous quote of Ralph Klein, we are done with being in business, in, in the business of being in business. What he meant was government has its role, it should stick to its knitting, it shouldn't try and pick winners and losers. And not a lot of politicians get that. Uh, and, and again today we're making the same mistake I would argue. Nonetheless, on the governance side, as with the fiscal side, these were some of the reforms that Klein and his colleagues brought in and I think were uh, fundamental to the later success that we saw and that you'll see here soon uh, with some illustrations and some numbers. Okay, why did Alberta prosper? Well, there was a firm foundation uh, that allowed for massive, and I mean massive, private sector investment in this province. You saw the results of it for the last 20 years and I'll show you in, in great detail uh, some of the positive elements from that. Private sector investment, actually let me go back here, the private sector investment I'm about to show you excludes housing because then for example British Columbia's numbers would be higher than you'll see here. I'm looking just at business investment. Why does this matter? Because it's a measure of how attractive a jurisdiction is, right? Um, Nigeria, even though it has oil and gas, is not as attractive as Alberta, or at least didn't used to be as attractive as Alberta. Um, <laughs> You know, because what, Alberta is part of Canada, stable, will never elect, you know, communist governments, that sort of thing. Um, just kidding. I'm not saying we have one, I'm just saying. That, that's a, well, I'm a political scientist, it goes back to my 1980s days. Um, anyway, the private sector business investment, it's, an, it's a measurement of how attractive your jurisdiction is. So. Let me show you something here then from 1981 to 2013. Uh, this is for a study I did a couple of years ago, and it's in billions of dollars. So the blue line is Alberta. On the very right hand side, you'll see 2013. That's the numbers there are just for 2013. These are inflation adjusted. Why does that matter? Because you're seeing a growth in investment across Canada, but especially in Alberta, to a lesser degree in Ontario and some of the other provinces. Um, it's inflation adjusted, so this means that investment in the country and, and in Alberta in particular was going up in real dollars. That's important to know. Um, and look where we crossed Ontario. Ontario is the red line. We crossed Ontario back in about 2001. And by 2013, to use that as just one example, Alberta had more private sector business investments. So think about the oil sands, think about factories being built by NISCU, you know, think about a, an office tower going up in downtown Calgary uh, and compare it to other provinces, right? Ontario, you have manufacturing facilities built. 
Uh, Quebec, you might have a mine or something. Um, Saskatchewan, you'll have potash investment by the private sector. So, but look at 2013. $84 billion in private sector business investment that year in the province of Alberta. That's more than Quebec and Ontario combined. And they have much bigger populations. Let's look at the rest of the country in billions of dollars again. Newfoundland did really well in the last couple of years, mostly from oil and gas investment, but, but some other investment as well. And look at Nova Scotia and New Brunswick and, and Prince Edward Island, way down there, right? Now, because there's different populations, obviously, in the provinces, different uh, uh, numbers of people, let's compare it on a per worker basis, because this shows it even more dramatically. Alberta's at the top in this slide, followed by Saskatchewan, followed by Manitoba, followed by BC. The short message of this is who's been driving the, uh, who, who's been driving the economic engine for the last 20 or so years? It's been the West for the most part. I want you to look at Quebec and Ontario now, and again, these are per worker uh, investment dollars. $10,000 in Quebec, less than that in Ontario. Look at the next slide. Where do Quebec and Ontario set, sit vis-a-vis -vis Atlantic Canadian provinces? Right at the bottom, right down there with Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. In other words, think back to when there was a lot of people coming to Alberta, flocking here from the west, to the east coast, from Ontario and Quebec. These slides show you why. There was a lot of private sector money coming into this province and Saskatchewan and to a lesser degree British Columbia creating the jobs, as you'll see. Uh, so private sector matters. Uh, sorry, private sector investment matters. That's what was creating the boom conditions that we saw. Now, okay, so that's the first part of a firm foundation. You get your policies right at kind of the macro level. You balance your budgets uh, provincially. You cut some taxes. You make sure regulations aren't killing your businesses. You actually say yes to developing the product that you can sell. Alberta doesn't sell warm weather, as we know, for the most part. People don't come here instead of Hawaii, right? And that's not why most of you came here, right? It wasn't for the great weather in January. If you want that, you end up in, you know, California or Hawaii or Florida. So the province said yes to investing uh, to people who wanted to invest in what we had to sell and have to sell, oil and gas and, and a terrific workforce. All right, so private sector investment leads to something else, jobs, job opportunities. Let's take a look at job growth over the past two decades again from a study I did a couple of years ago. Look at Ontario, 1.8 million jobs. Sounds impressive, except that compared to Alberta, we created almost half, about half as many jobs as Ontario. Again, Ontario has a much bigger population. Look at Quebec. Alberta, in the last two decades, created almost as many jobs as Quebec. And Quebec is what, two and a half times, three times our population, I think. BC came up the rear on that one. Now, job growth, let's look at just the past decade, until 2014 uh, in any case. Alberta alone created almost as many jobs as did Ontario in that decade. And Ontario has about three, three and a half times as many people as the province of Alberta. Quebec, we beat Quebec on job creation. In other words, this was the land of opportunity. BC did not bad, and Saskatchewan relative to its population did very well as, as well in the last couple of years. Now, <clears throat> What does job gr growth do? Well, it leads to low unemployment, as you would expect. So the blue bar is an average all the way back to 1981. And I, I, I show this slide to say, um, well, to, uh, I, I wanted the long-term perspective, because in this country, you often hear people who say uh, Alberta's made some sort of mistake by concentrating on oil and gas. Again, you sell the product that you have. And uh, our problem has not been, I think, oil and gas. As you know, in the last couple of years, it's been getting it to market. And the average unemployment rate in Alberta, despite all the booms and busts that we've had, still beats most of the country, right, at 6.7%. And the only provinces that beat us were Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And this is for the working age population from 15 to 64. Look at, let's look at the unemployment rate over the last two decades. We were the lowest in the country, 5.2% on average annually over the last couple of decades. Now, <clears throat> who else benefits when the foundations are secure? So you get your policies right, you get massive private sector investment in your province, um, you create jobs, the unemployment rate declines. Who else benefits when the foundations are secure? Well, those who want to work. So 
what I did a couple years ago is I looked at young adults, those who had just come out of university, the 25 to 34 age cohort. So I'd call them the young career professionals. Some of you in this room are in that, that cohort. I said, all right, where are the opportunities for young Canadians? And this, this study came out in, at the end of 2014. Um, thus, the numbers end in 2013, but you get the sense. Uh, over a 10-year period, again, Alberta did pretty well, pretty much the best. Saskatchewan snuck in just underneath us, but I'll put a caveat around that in a moment. How about post-secondary certificate? Where were the opportunities for young Canadians between the ages of 25 and 34? Again, Alberta. What about those who only have a high school education? And here's where I want to step back and, and remind you of something. For those who say Alberta over the last couple of decades, especially after the reforms of the Ralph Klein government, where they did some budget cuts initially, uh, and it was a bit tough in, in, in some sectors because of that, in the public sector, uh, which rarely, rarely takes a hit, uh, and rarely you know, experiences what the private sector does. Some people said, well, Alberta's just kind of mean, I guess, or it's not a land of opportunity for those who aren't smart and educated um, or have low education. That's not what this shows. The high school graduates had the lowest unemployment rate in Alberta, not in any other province, not in Quebec, not in Ontario, where they spend a lot of our money. Right? Equalization. And the next slide I'm going to show you are those who never completed high school. And I did this study, when I, when I created this study, I specifically created it because I wanted to find out, I, I suspected what you'll see, but until we did the data crunching, until we did the number crunching, I, I, wouldn't, I wasn't sure about that, but I wanted to find out where are the opportunities for the marginalized in society, the people who never finished their high school education, and it's really tough to find a job as a high school graduate, never mind if you never finished grade 12. Where would those people be most likely to succeed? Where would they mo be most likely to get a job? In Alberta. Alberta, in the last decade, the only measurements I used, I'm pretty sure it would show you the same thing if I went back three decades. In the last decade, the only province with single-digit unemployment rates for those who never finished high school was Alberta, the blue bar there. Look at the other provinces. I mean, look at Newfoundland, the tragedy of Newfoundland, 32% unemployment rate if you've never finished high school. Right? Look at Ontario and Quebec. And again, this is a bit of a rebuke to those from that region who would try and poo-poo the Alberta advantage or say we did something wrong out here or said uh, we don't provide opportunities for all the population because we don't, I don't know, spend enough through government or something. To me, I think the best opportunity, and it's not to be glib, the best opportunity where you want to start is I'd like a job, please, right? And where are those opportunities? Where have those opportunities been? Well, they were Alberta until very recently, and for a very good reason, because we got the foundations right. So when you're arguing with your colleagues, you know, or your family, uh, or someone else over dinner, and, um, or someone from out east, as we used to call Central Canada, um, and they say, well, you know, uh, you guys were, you know, oh, okay, when the boom times were on, you guys with degrees did well, you know, you guys in the oil and gas sector did well. No, everybody in Alberta did well. I have a close relative, and I won't say who the person is in case it's ever, you know, put this on video somewhere. I have a very close relative who doesn't have a high school education, who had to clean houses, and she made $25 an hour in Alberta doing that until very recently. And when those opportunities disappear, uh, it's the marginalized who get hurt first and get hurt the longest. And I've told this to CEOs in downtown office towers that I really didn't care all that much about their success when I was going on fundraising trips for groups that I used to work for. I didn't really care that much about them because I wasn't worried about the CEOs in the corner offices. They will do fine in a recession. They will do fine when things tank. And this was years ago before we were in our current state. I said, who I care about is the people cleaning the office. Who I care about are the people on the rigs who I care about are the, are the people manufacturing stuff for the energy sector in NISCU. That's who I care about because they're the ones that get hurt first when governments do dumb things that hurt the opportunity uh, culture that Alberta has created and I, didn't, I never wanted to see go away. And so when I saw these numbers, it reaffirmed what, I, what my gut instinct told me and what we all knew. People were coming here time and again to, uh, to the land of opportunity. That's what Alberta was and I think we can be that again. Now, 
<clears throat> all these numbers you saw, the low unemployment rates, were there despite massive in-migration, right? Because you can have a low unemployment rate, as Manitoba did, and as Saskatchewan has for much of its history, but that's because a lot of people were leaving, and in the case of Saskatchewan, until about the last 10 years. These are the migration numbers. These are interprovincial migration numbers since 1982. Look at Alberta, 340,000 people. British Columbia, and a lot of the British Columbia numbers, by the way, that were in the 1980s, uh, 1990s, sorry, not the 1990s as much, but 2000, and the 1980s, and less so recently. Look at Ontario, only 50,000 net uh, interprovincial migration gain. This doesn't mean populations in, in these provinces didn't grow, but we're talking about where people basically land and where they go to find a job afterward, because these, again, are working age populations. And look closely at where they were coming from. Quebec lost 240,000 working age people in this period. And again, these, these I, I, used, um, I used statistics all the way from 1982, because again, I wanted to track bust and boom in Alberta, bust and boom, and where we ended up on a net basis nonetheless. But look at Newfoundland. We know that a, non, a lot of Newfoundlanders ended up in northern Alberta in, in Fort Mac. Uh, look at Quebec, or I mentioned Quebec already, uh, but Manitoba and Saskatchewan. And again, Saskatchewan, if I showed you like the last 10 years, Saskatchewan turned out that around a bit and BC's number would be lower. Another benefit. Okay, so let's review. You get your policies right, you get lots of massive private sector investment in the tens of billions of dollars every year, you create jobs, you lower the unemployment rate, uh, you get low unemployment rates even for the marginalized, for those without a high school education. What's another nice benefit of that kind of smart thinking at the top, if I can put it that way, at the provincial level, at the provincial government level? Well, nice paychecks. I haven't updated these numbers uh, recently, but the 2012 numbers would look very similar in 2013 or 2014 and possibly higher. $52,000 per capita income in Alberta, way above every other province. Let's look at the increase, though, over the last 10 years, at least between 2003 and 2012, the period I looked at. Alberta's increase over $11,000. Saskatchewan was, in fact, no, Newfoundland was second. Right? When Newfoundland said, yes, let's develop what we have, we're a rock in the middle of nowhere, but we've got some oil and gas, let's develop it. Like Saskatchewan and Alberta, they profited, they benefited. And then Saskatchewan did well as well, uh, and, and British Columbia was fourth. Ontario and Quebec and the rest of the provinces all underneath the national average. Where were the opportunities? Where were the jobs? Where were the incomes being created? In the West and to a lesser degree in Newfoundland. You often hear this question across North America and the world, and I've debated this with some people uh, in the last couple of months, who say the middle class is disappearing. No, it was being created in Alberta, in Saskatchewan, to a lesser degree in British Columbia. That's where the middle class was growing and thriving in this country. And we all know that because we're all here. But for some reason, uh, not everybody understands that or saw that. And I, and I have to remind politicians and those who think you can sort of live in a pipe dream in terms of policy and, do, and, and enact policies at the government level that can damage economies, that they have to be careful. If they really want a middle class, don't kill middle class jobs. Don't kill your mines. Don't kill your oil and gas sector. Uh, don't kill the resource sector in this country, which is what this country has historically been based on, and frankly, mostly is. Again, you know, I, I think it's great when manufacturing thrives in Ontario. I think it's great when people can find winery jobs in my hometown of Kelowna, British Columbia. But the latter in particular, for example, don't pay you $80,000 a year, right? <laughs> okay? You can't replace mining and energy with tourism jobs. It's silly. Uh, so where was the middle class? Alberta and Saskatchewan, more than any other province, and more than Quebec and Ontario. Now, at this point, I will often hear a response, maybe not from this crowd, but from some. It's all about luck. Alberta, Saskatchewan, Northern BC, maybe well, or gas. Or you got potash in the case of Saskatchewan, or Newfoundland had some oil. Well, Quebec has oil, it's never developed it, right, as you know. It's got some natural gas in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. They banned that, frac you know, fracking in, in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Is it all about luck? Well, no, you have to actually let the resource be developed. But, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I'll explain what I'm about to show you. 
you will, often say, you will often hear this, and you will hear this from the people in power now in this province. They, was, they will say, and they said in the past, Ralph Klein just got lucky and his colleagues. Alberta just got lucky. It was a $100 barrel of oil. Anybody could balance the budget. Well, actually, as we found out after 2008, even with $100 oil, they couldn't balance the budget. That aside, <clears throat> let's go back to the 1990s. Was it all about luck when they balanced the budget in 1997? Was the investment that was already occurring, if I went back to the earlier slide and tried to you know, chunk it down for you, if I showed you just the 1990s and you see the soaring investment already starting after the, uh, the reform uh, policies that Ralph Klein and his colleagues put into place, if I showed you the 1990s and you saw those soaring uh, investment dollars back then, was it because oil was at $100? No. Top oil price back then in the 1990s was 26 bucks. The lowest was 11 Inflation adjusted, you know, the highest price in the 1990s was about $37. The lowest was about uh, 15 in 2015 dollars. So Alberta was not getting rich off of oil. Natural gas was doing a bit better in the 1990s, in the early 2000s especially. But Alberta managed to balance the books. Ralph Klein managed to balance the books in a situation very much like now. Him and his colleagues made some tough choices. They asked the public sector to share in the pain. You will recall, if you were here, they said, we're going to cut your pay by 5%, and they did. They said, we're going to lay some people off, and by the way, we're also going to let you buy your beer and wine in private liquor stores, because government doesn't need to do that. Government needs to concentrate on its knitting, and it doesn't have to run liquor stores, and it doesn't have to be in the business of being in business. And we're going to set the foundations right. And um, the statistics that I've shown you show that I think they made the right bet. Is it all about luck, too? Again, um, there's this myth that if you have oil and gas, you will naturally prosper. If you don't, you would be poor. If you have resources and resources are high, you will naturally prosper. No. If you look up on the left-hand side there, that's Nigeria. It's, um, it's uh, a refinery, uh, refinery facilities in Nigeria. I don't know the city, but it's from Nigeria. If you look at the bigger picture, that's Hong Kong. And Hong Kong, the last time I checked, doesn't have natural resources. And if they are, they couldn't get to them. Skyscrapers all over the place. I've been there. Uh, now, Nigeria, with resources, with oil and gas in particular, their per capita GDP, about 3,200. This is a, a picture also from one of the main cities in Nigeria. Look at the people on the train. Look at the shanty town. It's not a rich country, despite oil. Hong Kong, without oil, over 40,000 per capita GDP in 2014. What matters is policy. What matters is government policy. If you have the rule of law, uh, let me step back, actually. I was in Hong Kong two years ago, and I talked to civil servants, and I talked to politicians. And I've never heard this in Canada. Almost to a person in Hong Kong, all the civil servants I met and all the politicians I met said, you got to understand something. We don't want to be like China. We value the rule of law, and we value capitalism, and we don't want Beijing to destroy that. And they were telling me that as a representative of the institute that I worked for at that time because we measured such things. And they said, look, we, we want to keep our successful model because they, they understood that if you have the rule of law, if you have property rights, if you allow free enterprise, uh, if you have a, uh, a non-corrupt judicial system, then uh, you can make a lot of money. And that explains Hong Kong, right? An, oas an oasis of wealth, and if you think, especially before recently, I mean, China's come up marvelously in the last 30 years with its reforms, but it's still not Hong Kong, not yet. Um, those in Hong Kong understand this, they understand the value of, of the items I just mentioned, they understand the value of good policy in a way that sometimes in the West we take for granted. And you see countries around the world, regardless of whether they're, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their religion, you see countries that base themselves on good policy, uh, on smart policy, on getting the foundations right. They flourish from Hong Kong to Singapore, uh, to Malaysia, to Alberta, uh, I would argue Great Britain vis-a-vis -vis France over the last 30 years, and so on and so forth. Uh, your policies really do matter, and the politicians who understand that uh, will help a jurisdiction prosper, and those who do not understand that or, uh, or on some ideological uh, bend um, can be very damaging. Now, so to recap, What's the record to beat? Let's call it Ralph's record or experiment one. This is the record. Any government now or in the future that says, we're going to do better than Ralph Klein did and are they're critical of Ralph because it's not their ideology, he wasn't their party or whatever. This is the record to beat. Let's see your private sector investment record uh, 
uh, per person. And let's see if you can beat that record where we got to you know, 57,000 bucks per person by 2013. And where we were ahead of Ontario, the largest province in the country ever since 2001. That's the record any politician who would like to beat Ralph Klein's record needs to, needs to understand, needs to beat. The other record to beat, as I mentioned previously, I think one of the most important things is to make sure the vulnerable, uh, those without much education, have an opportunity. So this is the other record that I want to see any politician in power now, anywhere in this country, or in this province beat. And if they can't beat that, I think they're a failure because we got the unemployment rate down for those without a high school education to, to the single digits. That's impressive, we all should be proud. And there should be no apologies for what Alberta did over the last 20 years, none whatsoever. Now, that was the Alberta advantage. What was it based on? Low business taxes, low personal taxes, neutrality among sectors as I mentioned. Why? Precisely to attract investment. I and mean, let's step back a moment and let's ask ourselves this question because it's one that actually a lot of the political class do not. You hear a lot of chatter about, well, we're going to invest in the economy in Alberta or in Canada, or you hear this around the world. We're, gonna, we're, we're going to engage in a stimulus program that will stimulate the economy. It's good old-fashioned fashion Ken, Keynesian economics. What they never stop to ask is, all right, remember the Alberta slide where we had $80 billion in private sector investment in one year? If that drops by $20 billion, I don't know the numbers for last year, I haven't checked them recently, but if it drops by 20 or 30 billion, and you, you, know, you divide that by say $100,000, and you understand how many $100,000 jobs disappeared, how does the province of Alberta replace that with a trinket, with $500 million there, right, of your tax dollars, which come from the future if they borrow it, or they tax it away from you now? You can't replace tens of billions of dollars in private sector investment with gimmicks. And unfortunately, a lot of politicians don't understand that including Donald Trump, I must say. Don't get me started. We can talk about him in Q&A. So it was precisely to attract investment that Ralph Klein and his colleagues in 1993 started out on a path that said, balance the books, lower your taxes, get your regulatory climate right. You, know, you, need, you need regulations, you need anti-pollution uh, controls, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but let's be free enterprise, let's encourage private sector investment, and then let's let the private sector do their job. And they did. 500,000 jobs in the past 10 years alone, beating, almost beating Ontario. All right, what's the new experiment, briefly? I would describe it this way. This is not the cheery part of the session. <laughs> Turn Alberta into a higher government spending, higher tax, higher cost, higher debt, higher interference, business micromanaged province. Does this sound familiar? Kathleen Wynn, Premier for Ontario. Her and her predecessor, Dalton McGuinty, have done this to Ontario. The Ontario job creation numbers you saw that were somewhat okay, for the most part, you saw the benefits of that really when Mike Harris was in power because he had a philosophy very similar to Ralph Klein. I'm not saying any politician is perfect. I'm not saying, I'm not even partisan about it. I've seen conservative governments do stupid things. I've seen socialist governments do wise things. So I'm really not, I don't really care about the, the politics of a particular party, I really don't. Uh, because uh, how it goes is good ideas, good policy, politicians then follow that if the public understands what the good ideas and good policies are. So politicians are always last in the parade, right? I prefer to start with ideas than policies and the politicians can come along once I've convinced the public. Kathleen Wynne, so we saw it in so where do, we, where do we see this before, this high tax, high spend, your way into prosperity? Well, that was Ontario. And even now, they can brag a little bit that they're doing better than Alberta. It's relative. We've had a bad year. I wouldn't bet in Ontario long term, uh, or even in the short term. The other province that has tried this for decades, Quebec. I came across this most fascinating quote. This is what policy wonks do and authors do. You read the most obscure stuff. I was in a bookstore in Kelowna one time and I saw the Royal Commission report on, on provincial federal relations from 1940. <laughs> Literally, published in the first year of World War II. And it was a Royal Commission looking at provinces and the role in confederation. I think it was called Dominion Provincial Relations because we were called the Dominion of Canada back then. And I found this fascinating portrait of Quebec. Basically, at one point, these senators who wrote this report in 1940 said, Quebec, uh, 
pre-Great Depression was the fiscal Gibraltar of Confederation. In other words, they were, the, they were the anchor of Confederation. Remember that they were the business capital. Remember Montreal? Montreal, if you go there and you look around, they have these marvelous buildings, right, that came from a lot of wealth creation back in the early part of the 20th century. And they kind of never got it back after the Great Depression. Uh, but especially after the 1960s, when they went uh, into very high interventionist policies. So there's no guarantee um, that a province has to return to its former prosperity. Uh, that being said, the positive part of this, I would say, and this is a bit of a diversion from my talk, but I think it's important to say this, um, I think Albertans are fundamentally optimistic. I think they fundamentally, most of them, fundamentally understand that free enterprise works, that government has a role, but the government's role is to not to micromanage your companies or your lives, uh, and that they're not going to get you back to prosperity by taxing you into prosperity. Now, so this is the new Alberta experiment. Taxes, higher taxes, higher costs at, at the exact wrong time. You can't impose higher costs on a sector that doesn't have the money to pay your higher taxes. Higher debt and more interference in the province of Alberta in business, in free enterprise. I think this is the wrong time. Well, it's always the wrong time to do this list. But this is especially the wrong time. But that's the new Alberta experiment. And I predict it will unfortunately go badly. So I would ask this, given this is their approach, the, the new provincial government, I would ask this question of the provincial government. Do you feel lucky? Thank you. Now before I open it up for Q&A, I, I, I have to do a little self-promotion as an author. Tax me, I'm Canadian, your money and how politicians spend it. Second edition came out about two years ago. It's a bargain at 20 bucks, including GST. You can just slip a 20 in an envelope that we'll have out there or just hand it to me, uh, but you're welcome to take it. And it has cartoons, by the way. Okay. Do you want to handle Q&A or shall I? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Any questions for our speaker? Comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, and there's been this Nordic sort of uh, adulation for some time. Uh, I've never been to, uh, to, I've been to Germany, I haven't been to, to Northern Europe beyond that. Um, well, the, there are a couple of things. Um, well, I suppose the happiness index, I, I don't know how you measure, I'd, I'd probably be happy too if I lived in, in much of Northern Europe. I think it's a pleasant place and from what I can tell from the pictures. I like the, I'm an architecture fan as, as I've indicated. So I love their architecture. They have very civil societies. Does it have a lot to do with high government spending? Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, they, they have, they spend on some of the smart stuff like they should, like on education. Um, but I would say this vis-a-vis -vis Europe in general, whether it's Nordic countries or anywhere else, when you crunch the numbers, you see that they don't create the kind of jobs that North America has, right? Um, so it's a bit of a problem, actually. So as long as you have a small population and you don't want it to grow or you're fairly homogenous, um, you know, I think you'll have a high happiness index, right? on that alone, right, populations that don't, and, I, and I'm very pro-immigrant, by the way, so don't take this the wrong way, but homogenous populations, I lived in Japan, everybody understands the rules, everybody understands how things go. Um, you know, it's easy to navigate those types of societies, and I think even in terms of, you know, the lack of corruption, that sort of thing, it makes business easier, for example, to do in those countries than, say, in, you know, Spain, and I love Spain. Um, so, uh, and you also hear, I mean, because this question comes up, what about Norway? Why couldn't Alberta be like Norway, right? Well, I don't think we could have Norway's taxes and actually be competitive in the North American jurisdiction. Plus, what people forget when they make this comparison, I don't know if you've heard this comparison before, people say, why couldn't our heritage fund be as big as, as uh, Norway's heritage fund? Or it's, uh, it's uh, whatever they call the fund, the petroleum fund. Well, very simply, um, they don't have a federal government where two-thirds of their taxes go to, or I mean all of their taxes go to their government. In the case of Alberta, we send a lot of money to Ottawa, and that's fine. I'm not a separatist, but it's why if we took all our federal taxes and put it into the Heritage Fund, we might have a billion dollar, or trillion dollar fund as well. So there's a lot of sort of Northern European worship that goes on, but I think it, it, it misses some of those factors that I've mentioned. Right. 
Well, if Donald Trump becomes president, and I hope he doesn't, but then there's not much choice down there. If Hillary Clinton becomes president, or if um, Bernie Sanders becomes president, they all seem to be anti-trade, at least rhetorically. I think that's dangerous. Free trade has been the greatest impetus to lifting millions of people, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the past three decades, in East Asia, for example. So I think their anti-trade rhetoric is dangerous, and I think it's uninformed. Um, but you've got that in this country as well. Provincial trade barriers. One of the interesting things, and if you pick up Tax Mem Canadian to read chapter two, <laughs> you will see that I go into the history of, of Canada. And I didn't know this until I did the research for the book, and I, I've written about this in columns recently as well. I did not know that in 1865, a lot of the debates about Confederation were about, um, for example, George Brown from uh, uh, Upper Canada in the Parliament of. Upper Canada, I think, or sorry, legislature of Canada in those days. George Brown, founder of the Globe newspaper and a parliamentarian, was complaining about barriers between the provinces, right? He said, I go to Nova Scotia and I feel like I'm in a foreign country because they, you know, they, they hit me at the border with tariffs on my goods and, and my person. And so one of the fundamental reasons that Canada was created, not the only one, but one of the major impetuses for the, the creation of Confederation was to drop the trade barriers between the colonies or provinces. And uh, that's why, that was the vision of John A. Macdonald and a lot of the people debating in 1865, 1866, and finally in 1867. And here we are a century and a half later, and we have premiers and others who say, I don't want your pipeline, I don't want your electricity, I don't want your coal, I mean, I, I don't want your cars. I mean, it's crazy, you know. Uh, so I think the immediate trade problem is actually domestic, where we need to and I, I don't want to bore you with policy wonk details, but the federal government does have powers of, um, of disallowance where if they wanted to use them, they could basically strike down interprovincial trade barriers. Um, I mean, there's some debate legally about this, but they used to use these, these powers of disallowance all the time up until about the 1930s, 1940s. Uh, the federal government, the Dominion government of the day did precisely to ward off kind of protectionist trade sentiment in the provinces and other, uh, other bad provincial policies. And I think the federal government should get brave again. One of the interesting things about politics is you may find a government that doesn't have to, because it gets so many votes in Ontario or Quebec, the liberal government, for example, maybe they'll be brave and do something that Harper didn't want to do because he didn't want to be seen as picking on Quebec if he disallowed some measure from Quebec, for example. So politics creates strange bedfellows and sometimes good policies from places you wouldn't necessarily expect. But I think, I think the internal trade situation is just as serious and damaging to the Canadian economy. And frankly, it's a slap in the face to uh, the fathers of Confederation. Uh, I was just trying to illustrate how much more dramatic, when you look at per worker comparisons, the investment in Alberta was vis-a-vis -vis Ontario. Like it looks pretty, when you look at just the billions of dollars that in 2013, Alberta gets $84 billion in private sector investment, beating Ontario and Quebec combined, that's impressive all on its own. When you understand, when you understand the per worker figures, right, you understand why the competition for workers was intense in Alberta, right? You understand why the wages were going through the roof, you know? I mean, here's a side, here's a side thought. For those of you familiar with Marx's sort of, you know, rhetoric, you know, the 20th century and Karl Marx in the 19th century, workers of the world unite, um, where did workers have it best in this country in the last 20 years? Where were they in demand? Who was driving the agenda? It wasn't the corporate CEOs. It wasn't, wasn't the man. <laughs> workers got what they wanted in this province. Why? Because there was a high demand for labor. I think that's an untold story, and people forget this. When you, when you set the economy afire, right, you get what you want as, as an employee, right? As many of you in this, in this uh, room know, right? So I think, again, we were such a success in this province on so many levels, and, and I hope we can get there again. It will take politicians to make the right decisions, but we can get there. That was a bit of a, se uh, you know, a segue from your, from your question. But anyway, I, I just showed it to show how impressive Alberta's investment numbers were, uh, and Saskatchewan's vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Ontario and Quebec. Yeah, yeah. ma'am. Well, all over the place. So when you think about bond funds, when you think about people with capital around the world, when you think about pension funds, right? Uh, so international, international money basically flowing into a country, right? I mean, it can be from your pension contributions, which go to your pension fund, which later buy a share in a company, which later puts in uh, something in the oil sands, right? Or builds an office tower downtown. So it comes from wherever people have money, and uh, capital, as you know, is, is, uh, is very mobile. 
And uh, when, you make your, when you make your jurisdiction attractive, despite the fact that it can be minus 40 in much of Alberta for much of the, you know, much of the winter, um, even though you're paying great rates uh, to your employees, you're, you're giving great compensation, great pensions to your employees, or RSPs, uh, contributions to your employees, even though your costs are very high in a place like Alberta, as they have been, Money will flow in because it's a safe jurisdiction and people can make a buck, right? As opposed to Iraq or Nigeria where things are more uncertain. Or in a Venezuela, you know, like um, we were talking before about Venezuela and uh, the tragedy of, of countries like that. So, um, yeah, capital looks for places to invest in and it can come from anywhere. Um, and, it, and it's to, again, to Alberta's credit and to Canada's credit. Uh, that we are a safe jurisdiction, and I, I just wish the politicians would understand that. No, no, I, I, there may be that available, I'm not sure, but I didn't look at that. And in one sense, I don't consider it necessarily all that important. I mean, if lots of people want to come in here and buy up our companies, great, we'll sell them to you, and then we'll buy them back at a fire sale price during the next recession, <laughs> right? That's. That's what happened to, uh, what's, the, what's the Chinese company, the state-owned company that bought, uh, you know. So, I mean, you remember these debates from the 1980s, if you're around, you know, people had fears of foreign investment from the Americans for much of the 20th century, then in Japan in the 1970s, the 1980s. Well, you know, uh, people always overpay, and then you buy it back on the cheap. Um, Yes, in the sense that all the studies I released with various groups that I've worked for over the years have seen this, and, and it, got, it got a lot of play. Um, and a lot of the numbers tonight came from a study I did in late 2014 with some colleagues. Uh, I worked for the Fraser Institute back then, and it got a lot of play. Um, had I released it probably about a month after I did, it would have seemed odd because it was still kind of triumphal and like, look at Alberta. And then late 2014, you know what happened with OPEC. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, I think it still stands, and that's why I went all the way back to 1981, 1982 in some slides to show you that boom and bust, Alberta has done very, very well. And I just hope that the current group of politicians in Edmonton understand what they're playing with and the danger of, to their base, they like to, you know, the current government likes to pretend it's a friend of the poor. I think they're sincere. I think their economic policies, policies are sincerely wrong and will hurt the poor. And again, my main focus is uh, I want opportunity for everyone, but especially the marginalized and the, the least educated in society. And you don't get there by government fiat. You get there by tens of billions of dollars of investment money coming into your province, making it, make it impossible for employers not to hire everyone they can find. That was Alberta, right? And I want it to be that again. Other questions? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, I, I remember reading um, O'Leary's column. I get where he's trying to go. I'm not sure it's practical in an, in an environment where you've already got a $10 billion, $10 billion deficit. <clears throat> I mean, there is something to supply-side economics, I think. I think there is something to making it attractive. In fact, that's the story of Alberta, right? Cut your taxes, make it attractive. You'll get all that back and more if you do it right. Um, could you do it in this environment? I think, at the very least, you, you should say this to politicians. Um, and they need to be reminded of this time and again. I was about to say I'm sorry to pick on politicians, but I'm not. Uh, they, they need to be careful. At the very least, politicians should understand this ba basic truth. Do no harm. So you do not come into power and immediately raise corporate taxes. You do not come into power and impose a $3 billion carbon tax and not make it revenue neutral. Uh, you do not raise the minimum wage, which will put restaurant workers out of business restaurant employees, uh, sorry, restaurant, restaurants out of business and restaurant workers out of business in an already tough economy. Do no harm is really the first policy advice you can give governments because often, again, they, they get it into their head, we've got to do something, we've got to do something, we've got to diversify. Uh, and they chase around in circles, right? Uh, they chase their tail around in circles. So O'Leary's advice, I mean, in theory, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's even politically realistic in a, in a $10 billion deficit uh, economy. I just wish the current government would have done no harm starting last May. Right. Right. Yeah. Good question. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, uh, what about unions in Ontario? Uh, because they're not really competitive uh, with the United States. There, there are a couple of elements, I think, in Ontario. Uh, 
One is that sometimes unions are intransigent. intransigent. Um, I'm not anti-union. I think they have their place. Um, I think they can be, I, th I think in things, I'm a political scientist, not an economist, right? So I think in terms of power. Uh, and so I'm okay with unions vis-a-vis -vis business in the sense that, you know, every once in a while you get a bad employer and if they're a bad employer, they deserve a union and unions can protect some rights. That said, unions can be very um, stubborn. They can get their own um, inflated uh, sense of power and, and they, can, they can overwhelm, I think, industries or entire provinces or entire countries. Look at France. Union, the union movement is very powerful to the detriment of France, right? Because they don't compromise and they don't understand the economy. In the case of Ontario, so you've got that problem in some sectors. Uh, you've also got a problem of where a province said, we're gonna get rid of cheap electricity and impose high electricity. And so when you think about your manufacturing facilities in Ontario, they're paying much higher power bills and they're gonna pay much higher power bills, which makes New York State a great alternative, right, for investment. And that's another reason why Ontario has been losing the competition. So again, you look at politicians like Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne and you think, did you really think you could jack up power rates for medium and large sized businesses and small businesses and not have that affect your attractiveness as a jurisdiction for investment capital? Um, they just didn't think through it and they apparently still aren't thinking through it. And that's just the reality. I mean, I guess the summary of what you can say about numbers is that numbers, if they're accurate, matter. And numbers represent reality, right? If you don't pay attention to the numbers, if you don't pay attention to your own body weight and the number of stories below you, uh, you will have a very hard landing, <laughs> right? Numbers matter. If you don't get the, the physics or the uh, fundamentals right in your building, you get the, le the Leaning Tower of Pisa and not the Chrysler building. So, and this is often what, uh, you get into these utopian um, discussions in the, in the 20th century, it came from an economic ideology. I think now everybody's an environmentalist. The question is, do you get to 95% purity around the planet, and are you willing to crater entire industries to get to the last 5% purity in terms of environmental goods, right? And I think there's this discussion that we haven't wrapped our head around in modern uh, society where how much can we accept in terms of carbon or pollution um, without, uh, you know, how much can we accept without being uh, utopian about it, right? And people don't like to make trade-offs, but ultimately the numbers will kill you if you don't pay attention to the numbers. And that's what's happening in Ontario. The numbers, the power prices are starting to kill them uh, as an investment jurisdiction, along with the other problems they've got, their tax rates. Uh, I think their, their very stringent labor policy that uh, basically says, don't come here and invest, go to Georgia. I said it, it was a pretty good reason why I said it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, luckily, I, I am a, uh, a master of none and a generalist of all. Is that how it goes? <laughs> no, something like that. Uh, I wrote a pension study about three years ago on this issue and looked across the country at provincial pension numbers. And you're right. Um, basically, a lot of the pension contribution rates, so you're, you know, when you think about the pension, the traditional pension, uh, defined benefit pensions. This is really kind of policy wonkish for a Wednesday night, isn't it? After you've had two, two bottles of wine each. So I'll try and explain this very quickly or in an in, uh, in, in illustrated way. Uh, basically, yeah, pension costs have doubled, at least in terms of percentage of pension contributions of your salary. What this means is a lot more money is going to pension contributions these days for uh, public sector employees, uh, for government employees across the country, provincially, federally, municipally. Let me give you a clear example, though, of what that costs you. I tangled with the uh, teachers union and, and in fact the Redford government was introducing some reforms and I defended them on this a couple of years ago, one of the only things I defended them on. Uh, and I pointed out to the teachers union, I said, when you complain to me about classroom sizes or a lack of new school facilities, let's not forget that the teachers deal signed by Ed Stelmack and his colleagues in 2007 for five years was double the rate of inflation. Let's not forget that you put $1.2 billion in 2007 into the teacher's pension fund to correct a bit of a liability. Now those are the big numbers. Why does that matter? Well, because it, it diverts cash from building schools, from hiring new teachers, from providing health care, or keeping your taxes reasonable. So I think pension reform, it's one of those boring policy wonk things that all of us do at institutes, but it's incredibly necessary to get a grip on them because they're not paving your roads, they're raising your taxes, they're not building the kind of hospitals necessary for our mothers, uh, grandmothers, fathers, and grandfathers. They're not doing that because a lot of it is going into 
pension systems that were designed for the 1960s and not now, defined benefit pensions, and most of those are in the public sector, whereas in the private sector you have to save for yourself for the most part. I won't bore you. I mean, if you send me an email, I can send you the link to 2013, but the numbers are pretty, they are horrific. I mean, public sector unions say everyone should just have a defined benefit pension. What they don't understand, what they're saying is, everyone should have a pension above what market realities will deliver to you. It's a, and that's a Ponzi scheme definition of a pension. And so I've tangled with public sector unions regularly on this who just say, well, you in the private sector should just get them yourself, or you just, you, but you have to continue paying us. And I say, isn't it reasonable to retire at age 65 with a full pension if that's what you want in the public sector as opposed to 58? And I get criticized even for that. Like the unions won't budge on that. So I think there's a big fight coming in the next couple of years. Um, so I think you're onto something. Long answer, short question, sorry. When do you think you'll have enough? Well, I mean, governments can borrow, governments can borrow for a very long time. This is the problem, is that unlike a private business, governments can borrow for almost forever until they get into a situation like Greece. And, and, you know, and you have to understand, I think you know this, it's fairly common sense, but I'll repeat it. The reason governments um, are not as fiscally prudent as businesses are, they don't face realities as soon as businesses do, is because there's a different dynamic. In business, uh, eventually your shareholders cry, you know, uh, you know, foul and they replace the board and the president. Eventually uh, the banks stop lending you money and you go under. In the government sector, that's not, uh, there's, no, there's no discipline there, right? You really have to be in a very, 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 very bad situation like Greece or Canada in the 1990s before you get there. That's the problem. And you've got vested interests in the government. What's that? Right, good example. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I think you're right. And U.S. cities are actually a perfect example. And I think they've got more, um, yeah. Some of the U.S. cities, you look at Detroit, right? Um, you look at uh, San Bernardino, California. You look at Stockton. Their pension systems made them bankrupt. Again, the problem is, in Canada, we, we put up with raising taxes too much. <laughs> Solution to that is... So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so, are there questions back there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Um, there's kind of two theories, and again, this is where my political science brain can come into to play. There's, there's kind of two theories where uh, extreme circumstances throw up great leaders. You have uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, right, who arrives on the scene at just the right time. You have Margaret Thatcher reforming Great Britain. Um, I don't see any great leaders on the horizon, but I certainly, I, I certainly do hope they show up because it's been a very weird year. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Labor Party, the Labor Party electing um, Jeremy Corbyn, right, an out-and-out out 1970s style Marxist. Uh, Bernie Sanders and the Democratic Party pulling that party left, and Hillary Clinton pretending to be, you know, a quasi. I don't like ideological terms like Marxist and communist, and I, I used them for a joke earlier, but, you know, I mean, and, and, and the debate's really in the 20th century different. I think nobody actually believes that socialism works in the 21st century, uh, no one who's, who's got any uh, honesty or understanding. Um, the 21st century often, honestly, I think, is about interest-based politics, and what I mean by that is nobody thinks it's a good idea to nationalize an oil company in, in 2016 the way Pierre Trudeau did in 1976. But... There is a certain new utopian view of, again, like you mentioned, and I'm not anti-environment, please don't uh, take this that way, but I think there's a certain ideology that can come along with uh, a certain view of the world that thinks purity at all costs is okay. Uh, and I think that's a mistake and it's not reasonable, it's not connected into reality. That's one problem. The other problem is, as we talked about on, on cities, for example, and governments, you've got very powerful public sector unions that, especially in Canada, are not easily restrained. And what that means is the battles these days are more incremental. Um, it's not about the big, you know, does socialism work or free enterprise work? It's fairly obvious free enterprise works, I would argue, uh, if you understand it correctly. The battles these days are almost kind of hillside by hillside saying, your union in your city needs to be a little more reasonable on their pensions, otherwise we can't fi fund grandma's health care. Right? That's the battle these days. And it's not an easy battle. Why? Because if you've got a three million... Let's go back to local politics so I can explain it more clearly. In Alberta, when the Redford government tried to reform pensions, think about who they're up against. Uh, 
a couple hundred thousand union members who are very angry and show up at MLA's offices. That's the problem in politics. Those who have a vested interest, whether it's a public sector union or Bombardier, and I pick on them equally, both of those entities have um, a reason to show up to MLA's and MP's offices and lobby and make their case and push and push and push. You as an average person really don't because maybe it costs you an extra hundred bucks now or whatever, or 500 bucks and you don't notice it right away. It's difficult for the sort of the mass of the public um, until things really get bad to notice how bad it is. And you're busy having lives, having children, right? Taking your kids to Disneyland. Um, but if you've got a vested interest, whether you're a corporation after a subsidy or a union saying, don't touch my pension, don't reform my 1960s, my, my, my 1970s style pension, those groups are powerful by, by, um, by virtue of their numbers in the case of unions and by their clout and lobbyists in the case of business. And again, I, I think businesses and, and unions have their place, but it's really tough for politicians to say no. They don't like doing it to those powerful interests. And I think that's, that's a huge problem. It's one of the reasons Donald Trump actually taps into something, because he says, I'll take on these vested interests. We'll see, and he's not my favorite candidate, but any other questions? Yeah, and then I'll let you go. Good question. I mean, I think it depends on a whole bunch of circumstances, right? So, <clears throat> I mean, so I think Klein and his colleagues, you know, put the right policies in place. Uh, they made the books transparent, for example. I didn't mention that was another important, important policy reform. Said, here's really what our book, books look, look, look like in the province of Alberta. But they sent out very clear signals. You know, and there was some luck in the sense that, okay, uh, we have oil. If we'd been Manitoba, would the results have been as spectacular? No but we sold what we had, we allowed what we had to be developed, that was important. They did actually have an ally in the, in the federal liberal government, which did some good things about oil sands policy, right? Um, the Jean Chrétien government, the late 1990s, and they got their house in order. So there were a number of factors that came together, so I don't think there's any, all you can say is build it and they will come. You can't really predict a certain timeline, right? But again, remember that capital is always looking for safe investment places, it's always looking for a return and it'll flee from places, whether it's Venezuela or Alberta, um, when, they, when they think governments are about to harm them, right? And understandably so, because it's your pension fund that wants a return, so you can have a pension when you're 65. And they have a responsibility to shareholders and to stock uh, uh, to their bondholders and the rest of it to do that. Okay, well thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. <clears throat>